today I'm going to be starting a new series on metric space topology. And as soon as you hear this, you're probably asking one of two questions. First, you're, you'll be like, what is metric space topology anyway? And why should I care? Well, let me start by answering why you might want to care about this if you want to study more mathematics beyond high school, beyond calculus or linear algebra or those kind of computational mathematics class. The reason you should care is because if you want to study more mathematics, such as real analysis or complex analysis, or if you want to study more topology, such as algebraic topology, or say differential topology, or anything with smooth manifolds, the knowledge of metric space topology is a prerequisite. You absolutely need to know this, and this is a foundational, foundational college-level mathematics class. And in fact, one of the main reasons I'm making this series is because in the future, I really want to do some series in the long term, maybe say in complex analysis, algebraic topology, or, or these other ones. And, and I do not want to assume the knowledge of metric space topology from the get-go. That's a decent bit to assume. So I want to start a short series today so we have the prerequisite down for those of you interested. Fair enough, but you may still ask, what is metric space topology anyway? Well, let's start by answering what a metric space is informally. So metric space is essentially a set where we have a notion of a distance. One very basic example would be R2, which consists of pairs of real numbers and also can be represented as an xy plane, as you've probably seen in high school. And for R2, if I have two points on the plane, say you have a point P and you have a point Q, there is a really natural way of measuring the distance between P and Q. You can just let that be the, st the straight line distance between P and Q. So you can let this distance be the distance between P and Q. And this would be an example of a Euclidean, Euclidean metric. But this is certainly not the only way of defining the distance between P and Q. Another way of thinking about it is to imagine that you're driving a taxi between P and Q, you're driving a car, and these horizontal and vertical lines, these are the rows. So if you think of the horizontal and vertical lines here as being the road on which you drive on, it might be natural to define the distance between P and Q to be the distance given by driving down like this plus distance given by driving to the right like this. So the sum of these two distances, you can also define. You can also say maybe this is distance between P and Q, and this would be an example of what's called a taxi cab metric. Now, there are certainly more esoteric ways of defining distances. For example, you can say if the two points are not the same, then they are distance one apart. So let's say P and Q are distance one apart, and maybe these two points are also distance one apart. And no matter how far apart they are, let's just say everything is distance one apart. And this would be an example, this a bit of a stupid metric would be an example of what's called a discrete metric. But now I should hasten to point out that there are certainly many, many metric spaces other than R2. And one such example, and let me use the notation C001 to denote this, would be the set of continuous functions. So here f is a continuous function from the closed interval 0, 1 all the way to the real numbers, where here f is continuous. So these are the functions whose input lie in the closed interval 0, 1. The outputs are going to be the real numbers. And I will soon say a word or two more about what continuous means. But for example, here is an example of two functions in C001. So if you think of this as being the x-axis right here, where this is 0 and this is 1, then we are given these two continuous functions f and g here. Or more accurately, we are given the graphs of f and g here in R2. And by continuous, one way of defining this is to say, if I pick any point in the domain, so any point in the input space, and I consider approaching this point in any way. So if I consider approaching this point by, say, something like this, by this sequence, so you see that this purple point are approaching this red point, then if I look at what's happening in the output, let's focus on f for now, note that if we evaluate f at this red point, then we, get, then we get this y value, so we get this orange point right here, corresponding to, corresponding to the y value of the function. And if we evaluate these purple points 
on F, then we are on the Y axis, we're gonna get a sequence like this. We're gonna get a sequence that's approaching, that's approaching this red point. And if something like this happens, for any, any sequence approaching this red point, we say that the function is continuous. So for example, if I have a graph of a function that looks something like this, so you have a jump here, say this is a graph of a function in R2, then this would not be a continuous function because if I look at the input space, so if this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis, and if I imagine approaching, approaching this particular point with a sequence of points that look something like this, a sequence of blue points like this, then, then even though even though the output at this point is all the way up here, so the, the corresponding output is right here, when I evaluate the function at these blue points, the corresponding y values are only going to be here. It's going to approach, it's going to approach this, this y value, but it's not approaching this orange y value. So this would be a an example of a function that's discontinuous. You have something happening, something, something bad happening at this red point. Now I claim that this C001, this can be made into a metric space. So I'm claiming that there is a way of measuring a distance between two functions. So for example, a distance between this function and this function. And here's one way of doing this. And that way is to consider the absolute value of f minus g. So once again, if this is the x-axis here, and this is 0 and this is 1, how we are getting this orange function is by at each point, we are going to look at the value of f of x, we are going to look at the value of g of x, we are going to subtract them and take absolute value. And hopefully you can eyeball it and check that we indeed get this orange curve when I, when I do so. And one natural way of defining the distance between f and g is to take the maximum value of this function. It's not super clear that there has to be a maximum, but, but given that f and g are continuous, it turns out this is true. So whatever this maximum value is, let's say it's m, let's just define the distance between f and g to be this maximum value of, of this orange function. Anyway, the point of this detour is to just give you some examples of metric space. And now let's talk about the second part. What is topology? Well, topology is such a broad term. There's so much to it that I really cannot give the definition of justice in a few minutes. So rather than actually trying to define it, let me give you two examples of concepts that we are going to care about as topologists. So one such example is what's called a homeomorphism. And the homeomorphism by definition is bicontinuous bijection. So what do I mean by bicontinuous bijection? Well, let me just give you an illustration. So here I have what's called S2, and S2 is a two-dimensional sphere. So it's the surface, say, of the Earth, as you can imagine. And now let's imagine R2. So remember, R2 is the xy plane, pairs of real numbers. And imagine R2 as lying underneath S2 like this. So this is our usual xy plane, and we have the sphere lying right above. And now I claim that if I remove a point from S2, so if I consider S2 minus a point, so here the point is going to be the North Pole, so I'm going to remove, so I'm going to punch out this one point at the top of the sphere, I claim that S2 minus a point as a space is the same space as R2. I claim that these two are same in some sense. And what do I mean by the same? Well, consider the map given as follows. If I give you any point, in this sphere minus a point, say a point right here, consider drawing a line, a ray, say, from, from the North Pole to this point. So if I draw a ray, so maybe something like this, so this is inside the sphere, now it's popping out the sphere, and it's moving through the space, like as shown, and look at where this ray intersects R2. So this orange point, we let's map it to where this ray intersects R2, so right here. And we can do the same thing for some other point. So if I have another point, say, here, then imagine drawing a ray like this from the North Pole to this point. Now it pops out the sphere. And let's map, let's map this point to where this ray intersects R2, so right here. Now something to realize is that as this point is moving towards the North Pole, so as you consider points 
that are very near North Pole. So maybe a point here, maybe a point here, maybe a point here. These points are going to be flung far away in R2. So when I say draw a ray through this point, say, that ray is going to go all the way, all the way to say here in the plane. So of course R2 extends, extends all the way out. And maybe, and the closer we get to the North Pole, the far away we get flung out. So maybe the North Pole, I guess, can be thought of as the point at infinity. It's infinitely far away point, not really in R2, but as we get closer and closer to North Pole, we approach that point near infinity somehow. And now this map between S2 minus a point in R2 is really special in the sense that it is a bicontinuous bijection. It's a homeomorphism. It's a bijection in the sense that it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. For each point in S2 minus a point, it gets matched with exactly one point in R2 and vice versa. For each point in R2, it gets paired with exactly one point in S2 minus a point. And not only that, it is bicontinuous in the sense that it's continuous both ways. So for example, it's continuous from S2 minus a point to R2 in the sense that if I consider approaching this orange point on the sphere, say like this, if I consider approaching it like this with the purple point and I look at the image under the map, then it's not too hard to see that we are going to get a sequence of points that do approach the image. So it is continuous one way and you can do similar thing the other way. If I consider approaching any point in R2 with a sequence, so say with a sequence like this, and I consider where these points are coming from under the map, then it's not too hard to see that these points do in fact converge to the right point. So it is continuous both ways, and that's called bicontinuous. And now what topologists are gonna say is because we have this one-to-one -one correspondence between points in S2 minus a point in R2, and we have this nice bicontinuity property, then these two can really be thought of as the same space. Now you might ask the same question. What about just S2 versus R2? Is there a homeomorphism between them? Is S2 and R2 the same space or not? And it turns out that these are not the same space. There's no homeomorphism here. There is no map that takes S2 to R2. That's a bicontinuous bijection. And one way of seeing this, we're not going to make it precise in this video, is that S2 is compact, but R2 is not. So what is what do I mean by compact? So compactness is the second term I want to talk about today in this introduction. And to informally get an idea of what this is, say we have an infinitely many points in R2. So say we have infinitely many points like this. And maybe maybe there is a sequence of points that seems to be approaching something here. And maybe you have infinitely many more points outside. Now we say that a point in R2, so say this point marked X here, we say this point is a limit point of this infinite set in R2 if we are essentially approaching this limit point with the blue point like this. So no matter how much I zoom in, so even if I zoom in here, remember that we have infinitely many points. If this is X, no matter how much we zoom in, we're going to see a sequence of points that's converging to X like this. So this would be an example of a limit point. I mean, that's the only limit point that we see here. Now, let me ask you a question. If we have infinitely many points in R2, those that said have to have a limit point. And the answer is no, because if you consider infinitely many points in R2, that's just at the integer lattice. So if I just put a point at each of these integer lattice, so all the way out to infinity, that's certainly infinitely many points, but we're not going to be converging to any point anywhere. So that would be an example of an infinite set in R2 that does not have a limit point. Now let's switch it up and suppose we have a sphere S2 and we have infinitely many points on the sphere. So we have some infinitely many points on the sphere. So there are a lot more. Here's my question. Is it possible to have infinitely many points on S2 such that we do not have a limit point anywhere? And fascinatingly, this is not obvious at all and this is essentially a definition of compactness, that's impossible. No matter how you place the infinitely many points in S2, it is going to have at least one limit point. So no matter how we do this, there is going to be at least one point in S2 such that we are, we are going to be approaching it with the other points, with the infinitely many points that we have like this. So that's a pretty fascinating property of S2. 
And you might be asking, why do we care about things like this? And in response, let me respond with a different question. Let's say we have a sphere once again, think of it as surface of the Earth, say, and to each point on the sphere, let's assign a temperature. So maybe at this point, the temperature is 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, hopefully not Celsius. And maybe you have another point, maybe the temperature here is 20 degrees. And you can do that at every point on the sphere. And let's assume that you do this in a continuous way. And here's a natural question to ask. Does there have to be a point with maximum temperature? So once again, we assigned to each point on the sphere a real number corresponding to temperature. And we're asking whether there has to be a maximum. And you might think maybe maybe that's not possible. Maybe, maybe you can have an assignment of temperature such that it always blows up. Maybe there's a one with really high temperature, there is another point with even higher temperature, and you can you can keep on doing this all around the sphere somehow, such that we, we never have a well-defined maximum temperature. But it turns out that but it turns out that the answer is absolutely yes. No matter what the temperature on each point on the surface of the sphere looks like, as long as we're doing this in a continuous way, there has to be a point with a maximum temperature. And this is this is not obvious at all. And the reason that this is true is because sphere is compact. The strange looking limit point property actually implies something like this. And we will see this in action in a later video. This is what's called an extreme value theorem, where the domain is a compact set. Anyway, I hope that gives you some idea of what this series is about. I will give you more logistical detail about the series in the next episode, and I hope to see you then.